Brock bloody Lesnar. Look at his face. He knows exactly how much piss he's boiling here. He waited for all the tryhards to go out and bust their asses, and all the flippy dudes to wreck themselves, and Randy Orton to, I don't know, do whatever Randy Orton does nowadays. And then out he comes, nearly kills a cameraman with a ladder, grabs the briefcase, and sods off. See you in a few months, lads. And in honor of the MMA Tomato returning at Money in the Bank last night, I'm Adam Will born from what culture and these are 10 WWE returns that came out of nowhere. Number 10, Gangrel. If you don't like Gangrel, chances are I don't care for you. A cult favorite here at What Culture Towers, Gangrel is an amiable dork who loves vampire culture so much that he gave himself shoot fangs. Vince McMahon did not like Gangrel for this exact reason. Just a recap, by the way, Vince McMahon has conceived and promoted race car drivers, waste disposal technicians, magicians, pirates, evil dentists, evil monks, evil hockey players, anthropomorphic turkeys, and sneaky burglars. But a vampire character? <laughs> that was deemed far too stupid. All of which made his return a very odd, is this real life? sort of deal. Drafted in by JBL as pawns in a game with rival The Undertaker, Gangrel and Viscera having assaulted Taker the previous week faced off against the dead man in a handicap match. The Undertaker character, incidentally, is also undead, and he's Vince's most enduring favorite, the mad old bastard. Number 9, Hornswoggle. In a development as sudden and inexplicable as it was morbidly hilarious, Hornswoggle returned to WWE at the controversial Greatest Royal Rumble event. Now, we're sure this wasn't the intention, Vince McMahon just likes little people because they're funny, but if we were to take a resistant reading, this was some rib. The women's roster of WWE were not permitted to perform on the show for... Uh, well, let's just use the euphemistic cultural reasons. Because to the home nation, they were considered inferior to the men. They are not athletes. But Hornswoggle? Oh, that's fine. Hornswoggle also made a low-key problematic appearance during the 2019 Women's Royal Rumble match, wherein he chased Lena Vega around the ring with a disturbing horn dog expression. What's he like, eh? Number 8. Road Warrior Animal out of Nowhere isn't entirely accurate to those aware of Road Warrior Animal's real-life brother and the stroke said brother held in WWE at the time, but to those not aware, what the bloody hell was this about? John Laurinaitis served as head of talent relations for WWE in the years between Jim Ross and Triple H, i.e. the years in which WWE's roster was at its goddamn dirt worst. Given that Big Johnny once hired the wrong one-legged wrestler, yes, that actually happened, it's a wonder the thick prat didn't rehire Smash from Demolition instead of unleashing Animal onto SmackDown screens in 2005. Challenged to a WWE Tag Team Championship match by Eminem, Animal revealed his new partner at the Great American Bash. Heidenreich! Oh, uh, great. Number 7, Kevin Nash. Triple H remains close pals with Kevin Nash, so there's always a chance of Big Kev appearing on our screens in conjunction with Triple H. CM Punk in the summer of 2011 promised change and threatened to leave WWE if such change wasn't forthcoming. Ah, change. What changes can we make? Vince McMahon may have thought to himself. The very second CM Punk signed his new deal and in the process relinquished any bargaining power, he probably thought, we change gas. That's it. Bring back Diesel. He came back at SummerSlam and stuck the winner, having instructed himself to do so via a text message delivered from Triple H's phone. Ah, the summer of punk. What a load of bollocks that was, eh? Number 6, D'Lo Brown. Triple H was a fan of D'Lo Brown, and by 2008, what Triple H wanted, Triple H got. <laughs> Why exactly WWE brought D'Lo back? remains something of a mystery, but D'Lo responded to Santino Morella's open challenge on the 21st of July 2008 episode of Monday Night Raw. Delivering a wincing slap to Morella's face in the corner, D'Lo drew admiration from onlookers, and you'd expect, Jim Cornette, who rallied behind him with cries of, let's go D'Lo. Michael Cole on commentary called his leg drop vintage, so yeah, he's been repeating the worst call in history, for at least 11 years. A very entertaining Attitude Era act, D'Lo Brown's skits stole the show at Capital Carnage, 
Although that was an achievement. This more physical version of the performer didn't get booked, didn't get over, and was released the following year. Number 5. Kenny Dykstra Kenny Dykstra in 2016 subverted the wretched paradigm in which we now find ourselves. And yes, I got that from my word of the day toilet paper. In 2016, an inessential performer returned to WWE to play a tertiary role in a superbly crafted storyline between two enduring mid-card acts in The Miz and Dolph Ziggler. Utilized to poke fun at Ziggler's early years by his antagonist, this was a shockingly good and resourceful narrative by the standards of the modern era. Dykstra, to his credit, returned to WWE years after he had excommunicated himself for burying John Cena for breaking up his relationship with Mickie James in amazing shape. It didn't land him a full-time gig, but his signing is imminent, surely, since WWE is signing... every bugger not named Nails. Number 4. Bob Backlund Vince McMahon is batch mental. This isn't exactly breaking news, but it's always worth reminding yourself every now and again. Why? Why did Vince McMahon begin to sideline Macho Man in late 1992, only to bring in Bob Backlund as his old babyface self? Why did Backlund go the distance in the 1993 Royal Rumble? Why did Backlund wrestle at WrestleMania 9, a show Randy Savage commentated on? Why? 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 Oh. You say that three times, Simon Miller appears, apparently. Anyway, Backlund was such an antiquated boy scout of an act that Vince might as well have brought in Lou Thez. Number three, John Cena. At one time, it was thought John Cena was an actual machine and we'd never be rid of him. The git never got injured, and when he did, he returned so far ahead of schedule that he could only have been bionic. Hustle, loyalty, respect, then, now, forever. We were first stricken by this panic during the 2008 Royal Rumble, at which Cena returned from a major pectoral injury in one of the most shocking moments of the modern era. But panic wasn't actually the first emotion we experienced. We first experienced a sort of giddy euphoria at the sight of a man we literally could not deny as a star. And then we remembered we hated him. Number two, Tatanka. Or A Tale of Two Races, the setting for which was the August 1st, 2005 Raw emanating from the Mohegan Sun Casino, on which Eugene issued an open challenge to any hometown hero with the medal to challenge for his newly won Olympic gold medal. In one corner stood Kurt Angle, whose blend of racism, quote, what hometown hero could possibly be from here, Tonto? In the other corner stood, of course, Jerry Lawler, who greeted the arrival of Tatanka with a sneering, oh, it is Tonto. Tatanka, the proto-new generation uber gimmick, had returned from out of nowhere. And he stuck around, enjoying, nominally, a full-time stint on SmackDown as a babyface, and then, hilariously, as a heel who blamed his losing streak on the years of persecution endured by his people. Vince probably just booked the streak because the act was over 20 years old, in fairness. And everybody had the same reaction when taking in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 32. We thought we'd seen a man that had somehow travelled forward in time. And when that thought became fact, we all, to a man, said, Is that bloody Tatanka? What is Tatanka doing in there? Number one, the headbangers. As promoters, Vince McMahon and Joey Janela share just the one narrative device in common, the cluster. The difference being that Janela books this sort of thing with a meta nudge and a wink, and Vince does so involuntarily as he struggles hilariously to keep track of the utter chaos that has come to define 2019. But did you know that Joey Janela also apparently booked SmackDown for a few months in 2016? Bringing back a nostalgia act in better nick than anybody else could have imagined is his trademark. From PCO to the upcoming... Yes! S.A. Rios, this is what Janela does. Only WWE did it, and did it years after twice burying Mosh and Thrasher unnecessarily in the official WWE magazine. Harsh. They returned, improbably, on the 30th of August 2016 SmackDown to a uh, somewhat muted reaction, truth be told. One that didn't correlate with the endless What about the Attitude Era? comments on virtually every pirated YouTube upload ever. The match versus Heath Slater and Rhino wasn't 
particularly interesting beyond an abysmal commentary call from David Atunga. Well, these guys haven't been in the WWE for some 16 years, so you've got to expect some ring rust. Look, just because no other wrestling promotions want you, Otunga, does not mean they don't exist.